I'd like to introduce Cleese Erickson, who's the Senior Director of the AAMC Health Workforce Research Center. Uh, Cleese graduated from uh, the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas uh, with a Master's in Public Affairs. She worked um, subsequently at the uh, American Medical Group Associate Association, where she was the Director of Research um, and focused specifically on patient safety and quality improvement and patient and provider satisfaction studies. She currently at the AAMC is working on three topics, mm -hmm. uh, understanding how the workforce needs are evolving in the context of new payment and delivery models. They also do studies that monitor the health workforce supply and demand, obviously primarily physician supply and demand. And lastly, um, she has been a leader convening uh, workforce researchers. Um, there's a very important conference that's held every year in May, mm -hmm. uh, which has moved um, from being a primarily a physician-focused uh, workforce conference to one that is really fully um, sort of um, inclusive of all forms of health workers and um, a special focus, I think, on teams and, and the relationship of the evolving workforce needs to uh, a system and transformation. Okay. So it is that actual uh, topic that Cleese is going to talk about today, so um, it is with great enthusiasm that I want to welcome Cleese to our lunch series. Thanks. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to join you all today and talk about what we're learning in the Center for Workforce Studies about the workforce implications of new care delivery models and payment models. I think payment and delivery um, kind of go hand in hand, and Jung Young and I used to park that are here, we used to debate about whether they were really separate or together or the same, because um, that so much of the payment really influences how care is delivered. But I think it has, um, some really important implications for our future workforce. And today I'm going to talk about um, really the pursuit of the triple aim on, from three perspectives. One, looking at and examining the journey from volume to value from the accountable care organization lens. We've been doing some site visits with accountable care organizations. And then talk about the expanding scope of healthcare. So we're not just talking about what happens in the clinician's office anymore. We really have to think much more broadly than that. And then I'm going to share some preliminary results, which are not to be cited, um, but from a study that we developed at the AAMC in collaboration, actually, with Jung Young Park. She was the lead on that when, we, when she was with, working with us. Um, we have some preliminary results from that, which I can share with you today. So I'm going to start with the journey from volume to value and really centering on the accountable care organization. And it's, it's modeled to achieve the triple aim of improved patient experience of care, improved quality of care, and pop, improved population health at reduced cost. And a lot of people put a fourth aim on there of improved provider satisfaction, and then there's an implied fifth aim that is going to reduce our demand for physician services. And I'm going to talk with you a little bit about what we're learning along that front from the work that we've been doing from site visits. So we've done structured interviews to, sit to um, phone interviews with 16 accountable care organizations and two leaders in the um, systems that work on full or part in global risk payment models because they're seen as the future of, of healthcare. That's Western Maryland where they have um, essentially a global payment model to care for the entire population in their region. And then also um, we went to Alaska to South Central Foundation to learn about their program, which in part is funded by the Indian Health Services, and a part of it is a global payment model there as well. And then we did six site visits to some of the to um, the sixteen uh, out of the sixteen ACOs that we did phone interviews with, and it was really the focus of these these visits was to understand what was happening on the outpatient front and care coordination front across the settings that the patients touched through their participation in the ACO. And it was a mix of public and private accountable care organizations. We didn't just focus on pioneers or shared savings. We also talked to some commercial accountable care organizations as well. And what we're really finding about how they have, are transforming their health workforce is that it's based on the risk stratification that they're doing of their population. Because as you know, the patients at the top of the health pyramid, the high-risk patients, can account for as much as 80% of health care costs in a population. And so if you can zero in, if you really want to improve quality of care and lower cost of care, then if you identify who those high-cost patients are and redirect them to services earlier in the health care delivery system, you can go a long way towards meeting the, uh, the goals of the triple aim. And then they do slightly different um, efforts for their rising risk populations and then some towards their low risk populations. 
And the efforts that are focused on high-risk patients really center primarily around care coordination. Every single organization we talked to had invested heavily in care coordinators and how they can use them to help patients um, get to a address some of their transportation challenges. The care coordinators, I think, really focused a lot on what we think of as social determinants of health. It wasn't um, to make sure that, that, that they, it's, it was, wasn't all about medications. It really had to do with um, whether they had access to transportation or not to get to a doctor's appointment, whether they understood what the doctor had, had prescribed to them. If there were some behavioral health issues involved, they might connect them with either social, social uh, licensed counselors or social work or other providers that the patient would benefit from talking to. And really were sort of the, are, are the way that the health system can communicate among those systems as well. So it's not just that they're helping the patient, but they're helping the health system understand what's happening and respond better and, and share information across the different practices that are involved in caring for that patient. Um, some practices actually identified their, the top 1% of their pyramid and directed them towards intensive primary care, almost like inten intensive care units for primary ambulatory care, intensive care units, really. And that was where they would identify a, a population of about 150 patients for one half-time FTE then, that were also supported by a full-time social worker or a nurse practitioner and a whole team, uh, and, a, and often connecting them with behavioral health services because a lot of the patients in that 1% also have substance abuse or other behavioral health issues that, that really need to be addressed and are so linked to a lot of what their care needs are. And that wasn't ubiquitous across the um, accountable care organizations. That was one of the more, that was something that was happening in a few of them. But it seemed to have important implications for improving the quality of care for those patients as well as lowering cost of care. And then um, some are integrating social service navigators to help with either housing or transportation challenges. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, when I focus on exclusively on Hennepin Health. But it's in recognition that stress of not having a home or a job or um, you know, other challenges that a social service navigator can help you address really can go a long way towards um, helping get high cost patients into a more stable and environments where they will need the healthcare system less as a result. And Montefiore in, um, in New York has done a lot in this front. They've hired actually two housing navigators that are, um, one of whom was featured in the Washington Post about a year ago. And I think someday she's probably, I wouldn't be surprised if she was nominated for a MacArthur Fellow um, Award. She's just thinking so creatively and so energetic about what she's doing. She's a total powerhouse. I had a chance, the privilege to talk with her during one of these site visits. And one of the ideas that she's floating around is this whole idea of, of, a, of providing a Craigslist type service for patients who on their own can't afford housing. But with, if you cobble together the resources of two patients, maybe they can partner together and find housing that would be suitable for them, that would alleviate them. And then they're thinking about how they can do dialysis clinics um, embedded either in um, low income housing or, or homeless shelters as a way to better coordinate resources. And I think that's the heart of what's happening in a lot of these ACOs is they're thinking very innovatively about how to align not only the resources within their own institution, but with other external agencies as well. It can be a real challenge because, um, particularly if you're in a large metropolitan market where there are several ACOs and providers in the healthcare system, you know, it becomes harder to make the investment in um, some of these social and public um, community activities because you're, you're not just going to be benefiting your own accountable care organization and the, the communities are so large and diverse from where your patients are coming from. It can be much more of a challenge, but people are still moving in this direction. There's some exciting activity underway. Um, there, a lot of organizations are linking um, with agencies outside of their own, home health agencies, visiting nurse association, or skilled nursing facilities. To, to better coordinate care, even though patients in a, in a Medicare ACO can go to any of the skilled nursing facilities in their community, they aren't restricted. They're still looking to build up better relationships with some of those skilled nursing facilities and, and, and where possible encouraging patients, not requ you can't require, but you can encourage them and make it convenient for patients and also um, share information in the medical record so that if a patient, so what's happening at the skilled nursing facility can then be uploaded into the medical record for the patient. 
And in some cases, even if they, um, if the, if the skilled nursing facility does a, fall, a home, uh, a fall assessment, then they can document that in the medical record and account. So there's like a symbiotic relationship that can develop that really benefits the patient because there's better coordination of care and documentation um, and alignment of resources, which is really what everyone is looking to achieve. And then if the pain, and, the, and the other point I like to make too is that if in the home health aid is, notices that maybe the, the support system for the patient seems to be changing, they can alert the healthcare system if they have that kind of relationship built into their practices. Or they can do a better job of documenting some of the medication adherence challenges in the medical records so that someone can respond and maybe send another provider out to the house to deal with some of these issues. The types of activities that in the old system just aren't incentivized. Everyone would have loved to do it, but the payment model just didn't support that. And this is now payment models are really pushing more in this direction. And then um, for the rising risk population, transitions of care can be a real challenge in terms of whether you would escalate into a high risk, high cost patient or not. So a lot of, in addition to coordinating more with home health agencies, and skilled nursing facilities, there are transition specialists who their job is to make sure that when the patient is discharged from the hospital, that information is, the patient understands their information, that it's been communicated to the other, if they've gone to a skilled nursing facility or not, or to another agency, that all of that is, there's enhanced coordination about that. Because it's, it's remarkable how much of the variation in cost of care for um, patients can be mm. about the transitions of care. And so I think that's, a, that's how people are looking to enhance patient activities and lower cost of care and do what you can to help both the patient and the other organizations understand what really is required to keep that patient from escalating into um, a more severe outcome or a readmission to the hospital. And the home, when the, the transition specialist can even sometimes do home visits too to assess for whether you, the patient might have um, trip hazards if they've just had a hip replacement or um, or back poor lighting and address some and remediate some of those challenges that a patient might have. Um, that, yeah, Ed. The question of the, the high risk and the, this medium risk uh, category and the services, are the places in a very fine manner distinguishing this is a high risk and therefore you're eligible for A through Z and you're a medium risk and you're only eligible for A through you know, M? I don't think it's that you are not eligible for some of these other services, and I think and there's a lot of bleeding among yeah. these, but I, they're just looking to find out if you are a high-risk patient, it's now, they've, they've just flagged you for extra attention to say, are you, do you really need any of these resources? So things like the transition specialist might be available for the high-risk Right, also, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And that's a limited. We've actually been struggling with how to document this, <clears throat> whether we would have lines. So I think anything... You, if you're at the top of the pyramid, you really get access to all the things right. below it. And if you're at the bottom, you're, this, these are primarily the resources that are directed towards you. So that's a good point, and one that if anyone has graphic suggestions on how to better address that, we welcome them. Because this is, I, want, I should have said this from the beginning too, this, this research really is a collaborative effort with colleagues of mine at the AAMC, um, Shauna Sandberg and Emily Yunker. When I said we. Um, so then behavioral health, I think, is really an integral part of what many organizations are looking to do, but it's a heavy investment. Um, and so those that are at the more of the global payment model, I think, have more flexibility in investing those funds up front. But um, that can be a real way to identify need, uh, a patient who's come in for maybe a chronic care condition or some other condition, but then you realize, oh my gosh, they really have this immediate behavioral health issue that needs to be addressed. Otherwise, they're just going to come back and the, and the care is going to be complicated by uh, um, their behavioral health issues. And so um, South Central Foundation in Alaska has done some really, they started off with just six behavioral health specialists, and now they have, I think, over 30. And they're embedded and co-located in the practice in a pod, um, which I before I actually saw one of those, I, I sort of undervalued the importance of this whole open pod concept for communication between providers. But they're literally sitting in tables with no barriers between them. And if you have a patient who the medical assistant can turn to the, the, um, the social worker or the, the counselor and, and ask a question right then and there and get an answer, or the, or the family medicine doc that's part of that primary care team. 
and it, it's a, amazing how much that can break down barriers and communication challenges when you have that kind of access and co-location. Um, and then they do warm handoffs, so if a, if a provider, either a nurse practitioner or physician, is talking with the patient and realizes this patient really has something that, I, that they don't feel like they're as well equipped to address, they can page the uh, behavioral health specialist and they will come within a few minutes to meet that patient. They don't have standing appointments and these aren't long-term engagements with the patients. It's really to help them with their immediate needs. And they're supported with a psychiatrist that's that, um, on site that supports like six or seven primary care teamlets, each of which has a behavioral health specialist. And then um, pharmacists, I think, are an important component that I think still under accountable care organizations haven't quite blossomed as much as I might have expected, but they're trained to do a lot of patient management as part of their education. And they can really help with patient adherence issues and compliance. So if a patient is non-compliant on their medication, they can really get under the hood and say, well, of course they're not because this medication needs to be refrigerated to take it six times a day. And there's this other alternative that might be easier for the patient to adhere to, and perhaps less expensive. And they can really go through and think about things from that light or identify if medications are contraindicated and um, are being used in a variety of ways. And I had the privilege of hearing Des Gorman talk when I was at um, an International Health Workforce Conference. And he was explaining, he's the head of the health workforce in, in uh, New Zealand and just a dyna dynamic speaker. If you ever get a chance to hear him talk, you should run to go do it. And he was talking about how in New Zealand they'd done this experiment with pharmacists and primary care physicians managing diabetes patients. And at the end of the day, the pharmacists actually did a better job than the, than the physicians did. And the physicians, when they were talking about it, said, well, that's because the pharmacists, they had technology, and they had this web, and they had um, you know, more time, and they had this, this, and this. And, and he was like, you're missing the point. The point is you don't have to do it. Someone else can do it, and they can do it well. And it's just hard to get for, I think, a lot of times for for physicians and other providers to get their hands around the fact that they don't have to do everything. And that's one of the barriers that I think a lot of these accountable care organizations are encountering, not just with pharmacists, but with community health workers and other team members, nurse practitioners and, and um, physician assistants, I think, encounter some of this as well. And um, so I think that's one that's going to be a continually um, long road to hoe to get people really comfortable with with other team members taking up additional um, activities that are within their professional scope of practice, they're, that, that they're trained to do and that are within their scope of practice. And then um, certified diabetes educators are another component of, of, of how people are transforming care for the rising risk population because they recognize it's good to er intervene earlier for people who are at risk for subsequent complications and help them with adherence. And so they're targeting them to patient populations and um, with effective results. But again, these are not ubiquitous across ACOs. They're all experiments. And one of the things that we're really learning, too, is that it might be happening in one site that they're doing all these cool things, but then the rest of the ACO, it's not happening at that same level as well. And then for the, this is really for everyone, um, but this is, these are the services that are primarily geared towards just the low risk population too is that you have population health specialists who will call to remind you that hey you haven't been in for your colonoscopy or you need your flu shot and these kinds of activities so they're mining patient records to figure out who is behind on any kind of preventive measures. Um, wellness educators and nutritionists to help out with this patient population or for smoking cessation. Data analysts are a real workforce challenge <laughs> particularly in rural communities where they just can't get people with the expertise to, to help them with their data analysis and turning that data into information. Um, I think that's one of the biggest workforce challenges for accountable care organizations, data, data analysis and informatics specialists. And then there are new and expanded roles for medical assistants and receptionists, I think, that are important to note here as well. That medical assistants can be used for everything from scribing to patient education and referrals and, um, and screening for depression and for preventive services, and even as health coaches for patients. They're really, they're, they're, I think they're an underutilized resource as well. They're not, they don't just need to be used to room patients and take blood pressure and maybe get a patient list of, of things they want to address with the physician. There's much more they can do. And Utah is, is one of the leaders in the field in this regard. They have now have um, medical assistants who will meet the patient when they come in, 
room them, do their blood history and some of the physical information, then stay in the room when the provider interacts with the patient. And then when they leave, before, when, the, when the physician or nurse practitioner leaves, then they stay in the room to make sure the patient has understood what has been um, described, you know, said to them. And then they walk the patient out and f schedule them for any follow-up. And what I think is particularly cool about this model is that they have their medical students trained as medical assistants as part of their first year um, or first or second year in medical school. So they are trained as medical assistants and take on that role, which helps them get into the practice and understand what's going on in medical practice early and has the added benefit of them getting to be in the shoes of a different provider and seeing what they're capable of along the way and how they can be an important component. I was just on a call with another ICO the other day where they were saying that they'd invested a lot in training their medical assistants on how to do a lot of these things and then drop them back into the practices who were like, I don't know what to do with a medical assistant in this role. And so there's this, this you know, you may train one profession to scale up, but if they are not, if the, the people they're going to be working with don't know how to use them in those new ways, that can be a real problem and a challenge. And then receptionists can be used to screen patients when they're coming in to make sure that they're directed to the right services um, so that they're not um, coming in to see a physician if they really could really need to see a diabetes educator or, or whomever. And so they're taking on more roles and then also making sure that they're flagged for preventive care sometimes as well. Can, can I ask you about two other professions or mm -hmm. occupations in the context of this pyramid and what you're seeing in terms of changes, mm -hmm. registered nurses and community health workers? Yeah, I, when I was preparing for this, I realized, oh my God, community health workers on here and on here, and I didn't have time to update the slides. So I'm glad you raised that and reminded me again. Yeah, they're they are geared primarily towards the high risk end of the pyramid, and not ubiquitous. Some places are just basically saying, no, we're not ready for them. And I'm shocked. But we really think that it's better for a licensed counselor social worker to do this. So, is a social service navigator kind of like a community health worker? They can be, yeah. So that's part of, that's one role of it, but a very specific role. So they aren't taking on everything that a community health worker might do. It's really specific. Like they're trained explicitly on helping people either with vocational assistance or with um, finding housing, like in the case of Montefiore. So it's a, it's a, it's a sub, you know, or, you know, they might, if there were a Venn diagram, they might overlap a little bit, but they are very explicitly different roles. So a community health worker might connect that patient with a social service navigator that's explicit for them. Mm -hmm. I think maybe I saw Ed, you had a question. No, no. Registered no. Nurses oh, registered nurses. They're coming in a lot in the care coordinator role that's usually filled by nurses or um, social workers, but mostly nurses, registered nurses. That's where we've seen them the most mm -hmm. and what they're talking about. And they, some, there, are, there, there are some care coordinators that are assigned to the rising risk population too, and so they just have larger panels than if you're in the high risk population, you might have a panel of less than a thousand, you know, less than half, and I, it might even be much lower than that, but then if you're caring for sort of the, more of the general population, your panel size can be much higher for a care coordinator. And that, that role is almost always nurses. This is just, that's the real challenge with a lot of these ACOs. If you talk to, you know, to, um, depends on who you talk to, someone will say, of course, we make it, all these things available to all of our patients, but you're more likely to be pointed to them if you're flagged as an ACO patient. You know, it's, it's, it's a real challenge because, and if you, th and it's, fr it's one that can be frustrating to providers too because they want to do all these things for their patients and they have to realize that a lot of times these are, experiments and investments and pilot programs. So as I mentioned earlier, something that might be happening at one site isn't happening at another. And, and as I'll get to in the subsequent slide, it's only happening for a portion of the population. So it's, it's really an issue. And, and so when the leadership at an ACO might remind providers that we're, while it's only for this population now, it's for us to work out the kinks, prove the concept, and then expand it to everyone else. And I think that's part of why all these ACOs are participating in the pilot programs, because and they want to figure out how to get these pieces put together and enhance the communication and build the relationships, because that's a real challenge as we go about implementing new payment models, is just getting everybody on board with the culture and skilled at this new way of delivering care and knowledgeable. And as I'll show in our later slides from our survey, even knowing that they're in an ACO, you know, it can be um, a real challenge too. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, I was, now you made stuff about this later, but I was just kind of interested in the business case mm -hmm. for all of these different providers. Um, um, in that you've got a lot of different new new people and new kinds of providers. Um, and I'm a nurse, so I'm thinking that they're coordinating, that there's a huge move toward uh, increasing the role of RNs in primary care, mm -hmm. and that many of these roles, such as Many of the guys that you've educated throughout you, the nurses, transition specialists, this is a term I've never heard before, but mm -hmm. things like with the primary care coordination, um, you know, population health <coughs> specialists. I'm just Some of those are like college kids. Those things could fit under a nurse. Mm -hmm. so why not use a nurse? Is it because of the cost, the salary? I think that can be a part of it. So if you can get a medical assistant to do some of these things as much as you can, that's that can be as cost effective. I think they're really trying to get ultimately trying to get everyone to practice at the top of their training skills scope of practice. I don't, I don't. It's hard to use the right language, but so that what the things that they can do, get them to be able to do it and set up the infrastructure, the which includes both the technology of having a medical assistant have access to a medical record and, and be able to update and enter it into the medical record and have that authority <laughs> to um, developing the protocols for a nurse for a medical assistant to have standing orders and make sure everyone's clear on how those are implemented. So I think some of these, like the population health specialists, a lot of times those are college kids who are thinking about a career in medicine who take on that role. Um, and then, but you could have a nurse do it, but then you could have a college kid do that and then the nurse is free to do more of the care coordination activities and where the nursing skills might be called into play more. But I think every single practice that we're talking to is really struggling with what the right balance is. And I don't think any, any, <coughs> and any almost every ACO we've spoken with has said, we're still figuring a lot of this out. And no one thinks that they've got it all nailed and we're done. Yes? Um, you mentioned that many of these are pilot programs and experiments. Mm -hmm. Some of them, I mean, it might be a slight exaggeration, but let me move on to this one slide and I'll, and I'll get to that point. Um, let's see what's coming up next. So I think one of the things, points I want to make here too, this is a duplication, is that with the addition of all these team members, what we have found is we've asked all of the practices, are you expanding the number of patients you can care for as a result of adding all these other team members on? And we're just not finding it's that simple. They are, because it has to do with the expanding scope of services provided. A lot of the things that these team members are doing were things that may have fallen through the cracks in the past. So it's a way to add resources to enhance quality of care and lower cost of care because if you intercede and prevent a hospitalization or emergency room visit, that covers the cost of some of these team members, which I think gets to the business case question that you had asked earlier. Um, but you have to figure out the right balance of skills and mix and training. And then if, what's the real challenge is if you're doing this on, on a shared savings platform, you have to make some investments up front, wait a year, find out if you actually have any shared savings, then sa reserve some of that to reinvest in the programs that you think are working best. But then there's a data delay on, so it's hard to even know which of the things that helped you achieve that savings. So I think it's a really difficult process to fully implement and scale up a lot of the things that are happening. And then the challenges really are the financial model, data analytics challenges to figure out what, what are the, thing, the, the levers that were the most effective. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the cultural barrier. I, I would suspect the cultural one is a big one, is just as big as the understanding the financial levers, particularly when you're in, introducing new team members or expanding their roles. Yes. Well, the other thing about all these new team members and names is what are the qualifications for any of these people, and who determines what level of education that they have? Right? Mm -hmm. In the state of Maryland, I know they license medical assistants, but you know, in other states, they may not be licensed people. And what kind of education have they received, and should they be giving health information to a patient if they really don't know that information? I think a lot of them are focusing quite heavily on whether you should, they, you know, what the role is and making it clear what is and within the boundaries of what they're being asked to do. Like in the case of community health workers, I think they're, they do receive some training. It doesn't have to be um, a particular certificate. Like at the case of Hennepin Health, I think they have people go through a, a community health workforce training and then when they bring them on, they go through another month and a half of training on site at least to make sure that the community health workers 
know what was within their, their scope of practice, if you will. But they're very, I think, pretty clear to know that they aren't to provide medical care, but to really focus on the care coordination and... and um, but their role might vary from ACO to ACO. It will, yes, it will. From practice to practice, even. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you move people around in the mix, you know, the, the level of skill and knowledge can be variable. Yeah. And you have all these roles and not a lot of definition. Yeah, it's, it, that's exactly true. And, and I think that adds to some of the culture challenges because people might not accept, they might think, well, that medical assistant doesn't have a certi certi certificate to say that they're skilled to do this, so why would I trust them? And, but they may have gotten more training in-house than someone else. So I think that there's, or the, as in the case of one ACO where they just said, we're not using them because we think we can have a social <coughs> worker do it, and then they can do everything right then and there. We won't have to ref do, deal as much with the referral, but. I think that a big issue is that they may be so much more accessible than, say, the physician. Wh who is? To the, uh, a medical assistant or whatever, maybe to the, the patient. Right. Yeah, I think that's an important component because um, if you have, if, when a patient, a physician talks to you, you might be reluctant to ask questions or embarrassed to reveal certain information about yourself. And so a lot of medical assistants kind of function as community health workers, coaches, and get some of that information from the patient because they probably are more likely to be from the same community as the patient population themselves. And I think that's really an important aspect that um, that break comes into play with the people who are um, digging into some of these issues about social determinants of health in particular. Because you might want to talk to your physician about the fact that your electricity is about to be cut off or that you're not sure where your next meal is coming from. But maybe you can get into a conversation with a community health worker who knows a little bit about how to orient these conversations or just is someone that looks like you and talks like you and is from the neighborhood that you grew up in. You just, there are different signs and signals that make a patient more comfortable sharing that information. And so, but, but the practice may not be comfortable with that role and provider and giving that much responsibility out. And that's where we're, I think all of them are kind of struggling with what's the right mix for their patient population, for their provider population, for their health system. And, and what resources are around because they may not have access to a community health worker training program in their community either or um, and have to build some of that up from the ground. And I think that's a real opportunity that's out there is for how we can build infrastructure to support training of community health workers. And one of the issues, we had a, a summit at the AAMC that was co-sponsored by NEHI um, and the Jewish Healthcare Foundation to really understand the role of community health workers and how it's evolving and what their future direction is like. And they're going to have to decide as a profession whether they want to be one that they're, they themselves are organizing for, wow, we really want to turn into a profession that has this certification requirements and we've built our own community of practice and, social, and, and their own social support networks and training. And they're doing some of that on the state basis. But do they want to start to do that at the national level and really make themselves a defined profession, but that comes with limitations then because then what about promotoras who may or may not be paid and what, what about health coaches that have a slightly different scope of, of activities that they're involved in? Is it more of a negative trade-off to sort of rule out those people who are being very effectively integrated in, in different practice settings? I think that those are some real challenges that have to be dealt with in the future. Um, this one I think is one that we've had for a while, but I think it's so important. We've covered a lot of the topics. I won't go into the grounds of it. but. ACOs are looking to incorporate some of these things, like paying for a vacuum cleaner is a lot cheaper than paying for a hospital admission for an asthma exacerbation. Or paying for a cell phone and, and the time for a social worker to just text someone to say, hey, how are you doing? Or Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or whatever is a, is a relatively low cost way at least to help a patient stay connected. And a lot of times they aren't even necessarily limiting the cell phone use to communicating or the bus passes to communicating with their practice because they recognize that the ability to have social interactions more broadly than that will help a patient just have a better functioning and quality of life too. But then you can get into issues of needing waivers and whether you are then um, dealing with the issue of um, enticement into your plan. And so there's a lot, of, there's some limitations that prevent ACOs from fully embracing some of these activities as much as they would like.
And then legal counsel. I think one of the, another underutilized service is the medical legal partnership. And when you can help bring in the, the uh, legal system to help a patient deal with housing ch troubles, like one patient who was living in a, a high-rise um, subsidized housing building where the elevator didn't work and she lived on the eighth floor. It's really hard for her to go up and down eight flights of stairs. And so that health system realized that it wasn't just her, but other patients that were living there too. And so they really put the squeeze on the city to address that, that elevator and get it fixed. So things like that are happening or to address um, substandard housing that's mold or rodent infested and, and they use the medical legal partnership to do that and identify larger systemic issues too so it's not just one off but how can that whole um, community really better deal with housing quality standards for everyone. I've talked a lot about Hennepin in the past, but they really, uh, one, I just, one important insight to draw out from them is that the importance of um, dental care to a lot of these patients. And if you can go out into a community, that's the other point too, is that they actually go out into the community. They're not waiting for patients to come to them into the health system. And so they'll go to homeless shelters or other service areas where you might find patients who have, that are Medicaid eligible and um, say, we can connect you with a dentist. And that was much more effective in getting patients' attention than saying, hey, we can get you connected with a primary care doctor. So um, that's, I think that's an undersold resource. And at their federally qualified health center, they had the dental services and, and um, right on site. So then they could just walk the patient over to connect them with primary care after they had dealt with the dental issue. And they also, when the patient admitted to the emergency room for a dental pain, instead of just giving them pain medication, they actually referred them to the dental care so that they fixed the problem that was causing the dental pain versus just treating the, the, um, the pain issue. But not everyone has access to dental care coverage. It's a shame. Um, so this gets to the point of the uh, uptake that you were talking about. So a lot, an ACO has all these different moving parts that are a component of it. And so what might be happening at group practice A isn't necessarily happening at group practice B, and they might have different cultures. They may have been located in different cities. Their electronic medical records may or may not talk to them. They um, need to build relationships with all the hospitals that are in, you know, and, and other post-acute providers because patients can, and particularly in Medicare ACOs, can self-select in or out of the ACO network. And, they, and if they can do more to enhance the coordination of care with as many of those other providers, they can really help to lower their cost of care. And then it takes time to align with community partners. And there's some, so in one ACO, they might be uh, in one city, have a great relationship with maybe the grocery store in their community to, to have people on site to educate them about nutritional eating. But not every ACO, every site in that, even one ACO is moving that model. And they're just all, even within an accountable care organization that's a pioneer or ACO, there are going to be so many different things happening at different places because they're trying to experiment and then bridge out. So it's not like, and I don't want to say that it's all pilot because some things are moving out, like team huddles are an important component that um, I think is happening at every site and it's accountable care organization. But there's just a lot of tinkering and experimenting and nothing is fully worked out. And the ones that are doing it most effectively are having these coordinating meetings where if someone has figured something out, within a month everyone can learn about it and implement it. Or um, if you, something isn't working, then you have a forum to come and share, like you've asked us to do this, but this isn't working and this is why, and then there can be a, a larger discussion about it to help involve everyone in fixing the problem. And then this gets to the point that not everyone is in an ACO at that site, and so care is going to be different, and that's and that the rest of this population is on a fee-for-service model. And even the ACOs, when we were visiting them last year that were in the Pioneer, they're still on a fee-for-service model and being reimbursed retrospectively. At that. So it's still um, fee-for-service even for ACO patients, but at, at the time of the point of care. And then one of the sites we went to was at 50% at risk when you counted, um, but that still left 50 who were fee-for-service. So, I mean, it's, it's a real challenge to figure out how to do this and to make the appropriate investments and scale up the way you would really like to, given that not all of the patients are being, are are, you're not compensated the same way for all the patients. Everyone really wants to move to having, I think everyone that's involved in risk models kind of wants to move to the full risk model because they see the, the power of what they're doing and the limitations of being in a shared savings approach. But it's scary 
given that you don't know exactly how payment models are going to evolve in the future and how much to invest right now? And, and, and which are the most effective levers? And then last year, when uh, this is a little dated, but only 6% of the population was in the ACO as of January, last January. And the savings from the 2013 shared savings ACOs was less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of of total Medicare costs. So it gives some perspective, you know, because I, I tend to get really excited about all these things. I think, oh my gosh, healthcare is transforming across the board. And then you dig under the hood, it's like, well, there's a lot of innovative things happening, and, but it, who knows exactly how long it's going to take for it to become the way things are across the board for everyone. But, and, but ACOs aren't the only transformation effort, and this is not the comprehensive list either, but these are some of the big ones of comprehensive primary care initiative that's sponsored by the CMMI, bundled payments, episode-based care, where instead of paying for a single point of service, you're paying for a whole episode and it encourages people to be better about coordinating care. The state of Arkansas is kind of taking the lead in this. Um, the new Medicare care coordination payments for their chronic care patients. Private insurance efforts to rein in costs. I don't know if any of you are in Care First, Blue Cross Blue Shield in this area, but they are paying primary care docs to incentivizing them to be more efficient and, pay, and coordinating care for their patients. And if they come under certain spending targets, then they get to share in that savings. And I think they've been pretty successful across the board in getting those shared savings. And then the CMMI innovation challenges, I think they're in the year two or three, are wrapping up, so hopefully we'll learn some more from them. And then their efforts to improve coordination between primary care and specialty care that, um, that are about. And then I think it's also important to talk about technology. You notice I didn't mention it that much in my talk earlier, and it's because most of the ACOs aren't currently doing a lot with technology because the payment models don't incentivize that because you're not reimbursed for that point of care. Um, but I think they see that as the future, and some of them are making pretty significant investments. And one person mentioned in a company that starts with an A or a G, um, and see that as a way to, and he pointed to like the Fitbit concept of constantly monitoring information, feeding it into a large system, and then you develop the algorithms to notice when someone is at risk for a major complication, you intercede earlier. And he is a firm believer that you can get to panel sizes of 10,000 with that kind of technology um, right now. We, and, and I think it's important, to, as I think I said earlier, that no one that we had talked, no organization that we talked with had yet increased their patient panel size dramatically. They may have one or two that have done some increases, but it's not like a systemic, now we care for that many more patients. <coughs> so I really question whether we're bending the workforce curve the way people think we are, given all these challenges, but we're still in the beginning stages. Even, pilot, even pioneer organizations, I would think, I think still kind of consider themselves at the beginning, and versus, closer to the beginning than the end of their transformation process. And I'm not going to walk through this, but it just talks about different. Gets, the whole concept is that um, you can, you, that it's not just about you know, doing things that have been done before, it's about expanding scope of services. And then I don't think we have time for the survey, or do you want to, what do you think? Um, can you say a few words about what it is, and then maybe we will have you back another time to talk about the results? <laughs> sure, yeah, because I don't really have firm results anyway. It's, uh, it's, we're at the, we've, it's got a 40% response rate, but it's a survey that we, we piloted in Cleveland, which is where Cuyahoga County is. And um, it's to really, the, it served a dual purpose to inform a local projections model that we're developing, but also to test questions related to um, transformation of care. And I brought a copy of the survey instrument here. and Welcome any kind of feedback um, that people have on it. Because it's, um, we really want to use this to get some quantifiable data. All the information I presented to you is qualitative. It's subject to interpretation, and and, it's, and any, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that people are more likely to hear and believe evidence that points to their own presuppositions. And I worry, am I screening out information that doesn't conform to my supposition that about supplementing versus substitution? And so we wanted to provide some harder data to back that. Um, and it's a challenge, and I'll talk more about the challenges that we asked about whether the physician was in an accountable care organization. 29% don't know of the people. Oh. <laughs> uh, patient center medical home, 25% didn't know if they were in one at that site. Pay for performance, bundling, risk stratification. So it's hard to find out whether participation in an ACO or not is changing things if half of them can't even tell you whether they're in one or not. 
Um, they don't, uh, many don't know their panel size of, um, you know, 36% didn't know their panel size of specialist and 32% of primary care docs. So then it's hard to say, you know, and Jung Young warned us about this. She, she was involved in the survey. She she's, didn't think this was a great way to get information about uh, panel capacity and she was right. But what is the right way to get it? You know, practice survey, because one of the things we're learning from the accountable care organizations is that each practice is a little bit different and how do you even define that practice and who would fill that survey out and would, and would if you gave it to three people at that practice, would they all answer it the same way? You know, I think that's a real challenge. Um, and then most physicians do not plan to participate in transformation activities <clears throat> that we've listed here. So these are just a few of the examples of team huddles. Was the most <laughs> likely to have been used? And then using scribes, the least likely, but we hear a lot of talk about them in the marketplace. Um, community health workers was low, but this, what we wanted to find out is like get some better questions so that we can take this on a national scale and start to tease things out a little bit more and figure out if we can ask the panel size question so a little bit. A geographically defined sample, mm -hmm. like how many physicians? 2,500. We sent it to 2,500. We've got about 1,000 back, half primary care, half specialists. And we're going to do one more round um, to see if we can bump up the 50, to 50% response rate. We sent a $10 Starbucks gift incentive. We followed the Dillman method. Um, with the pre-notification, to the survey mailing, to the thank you postcard, to the follow-up survey mailing, and... Um, and you're the double AMC. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if it came from us. <laughs> so, yeah. What does it mean for physicians to participate, participate in transformation activities with community health workers? What, what does that mean? That they pers the question wording, um, I don't know if I kept a copy for myself, was... Um, at this site, are you yourself currently implementing or planning to implement any of the following, um, working with community health workers slash health coaches? It's question 26 on page three. But remember, do you know anything about the respondents and non-respondents? They, they match on the demographics. You know, so we have uh, maybe more females because females tend to respond to surveys more, I think. but. Um, but otherwise, the demographics match. But we don't know what's different about that 60%.